means objects don't radiate in, in the visible. You, you know if you heat something up enough, it'll glow red and then glow bright. Mm -hmm. um, but below there, it just radiates in the infrared. But you can feel that if you go near a radiator or a hot oven. Um, at room temperature, the peak is in the far infrared, uh, which the far end of the infrared in that picture. Um, you don't much feel that. At microwave frequencies, the thermal peak is very low in temperature, way below 300 degrees. Um, it's only a few Kelvin. So everything around us is radiating microwaves. We're exchanging microwaves with each other all the time, and we just don't notice it. Uh, there are a whole bunch of wavelength ranges listed up here. Astronomy originally, of course, started in the visual, but now it exists in all of those ranges. Uh, the thing you've been hearing about most recently, the JWST, is, a, is measuring in the near infrared, which is part of the infrared near the visual. And it's learning about the early universe. I'll mostly be talking about radio astronomy and microwaves expressing power in terms of the equivalent temperature of a the thermal source. Well, getting to Homedale. Originally, Bell Labs was on West Street in New York City. But in the 20s, they were interested in doing radio research. And there was a lot of electrical noise in the city. So they established several field stations in New Jersey to make measurements. Eventually, those all came together in Hondau. The interest was using high-frequency radio for transatlantic telephony. Uh, the primary charter was research on long-distance communications. In 1928, Art Crawford and Carl Jansky were hired. They initially roomed together. They were directly out of college, and um, knew each other quite well. This picture is a 1933 picture of the building they lovingly call the turkey shed. I guess it's a little larger than a, than a chicken shed. Uh, and this is the group of people there. Um, let's see, we have our crop groups. Art Crawford here. We have L. Beck over here, who invented the horn reflector, and several other people. Well, Jansky is right about here, I think. I can't tell where that is. Don't see a pointer. Oh, oh sorry. Just point to it. Oh, now you got it. Okay. So we have there you go. Art there. Yep. <laughs> Well, anyway, I'll back here. Um, Carl was tasked with understanding sources of noise on the proposed transatlantic shortwave radio connections. He built this large 95-foot rotating directional antenna and a sensitive radio receiver and recorded its output. In addition to thunderstorms, man-made noise, and maybe other transmissions, he found a hiss-like noise, <coughs> which came from the same direction about the same time every day. After a couple of years of observing this, and with the help of a, uh, an amateur astronomer in Princeton, uh, he, he figured out that this was radio noise coming from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. This started the science of radio astronomy. He reported these results in engineering terms that regular astronomers didn't understand, so not much happened for a while. Um, it was reported in the New York Times. If you look down there on the bottom, uh, Carl said, 
There's no evidence that this is from an alien civilization. <laughs> Unfortunately, Carl died young in the late 40s from a chronic kidney disease, didn't live to see radio astronomy become an important science. The group started working on microwave relays, a way of getting high, high bandwidth transmission across the country. And they worked on that through the 30s and into the 40s. During World War II, they mostly worked on radar. Well, however, they were still thinking about microwave systems. And microwave systems were first installed right after World War II. Let's see. On um, the bottom here is a horn which expands rapidly. And the problem with that is that the radio waves continue expanding rapidly also, so it doesn't point in any very well in a specific direction. The solution to that is to put a, hand, put a, a lens in front of it, which can straighten it out. And you get the possible installation like on the upper right. People also thought about making the horn longer so that it expands less rapidly and then it would work. And put a, have it going up the tower and put a reflector at the top. That was a rather awkward looking thing. Yeah. So one day Al Beck was thinking about it and thought, there must be something better than a flat reflector I can put up there. He pulled out something that probably none of you thought about since college, and that is uh, calculus of variations, and tried to figure out what the best surface would be. Turned out, he reinvented the paraboloid. And so, he designed the horn reflector. A relatively short horn with a bit of a paraboloid that straightens out the waves so that it has a nice sharp pattern. And the nice thing about it is that the receiver at the focus is very well shielded from the ground and all of the 300 degree radiation that, that might be hitting it. Here's a picture of some horn reflectors uh, on the tower. I think I took this picture in Texas. But, uh, <clears throat> it shows, uh, to some extent, the advantage of the horn reflector. If we look at the one on the right, there might be a weak signal coming in from the other direction, going into that horn reflector. It goes down the waveguide to a building at the bottom, and there it's amplified, comes back up a waveguide of another one, and goes out again at a much stronger signal. The two horn reflectors, back to back, have a very good isolation. So it's an ideal sort of antenna for that sort of application. Moving ahead a little bit, uh, John Pierce was a polymath at Bell Labs. Uh, he, uh, he invented many things. He wrote a book about electron beams. He worked on communication theory with Claude Shannon. He started the first computer music group. And on the side, he wrote science fiction under the pseudonym J.J. Coupling, which might mean that something to any of you who are physicists. In 1995, John Pierce published a paper in Jet Propulsion titled Orbital Radio Relays. He was apparently unaware of Arthur Clarke's extraterrestrial relays in the marvelous world in 1945. In any way, the, the, the science fiction people were thinking ahead. In 1957, as you probably all know, the Russians launched Sputnik. Uh, John woke up, Bell Labs woke up. It was a time to think about communication satellites more seriously. In 1958, uh, NASA proposed launching a 100-foot diameter uh, metallized mylar balloon to measure forces in orbit. It would be very low mass, but a huge area. And so if there was any drag up there, it would be very subject to drag. 
Bell Labs heard about this and proposed using ECHO as a first communication satellite. It wouldn't be very useful because a wave hitting the satellite, the sphere will be scattered in all directions. It will be very weak when it gets back to Earth. So, they would combine two Bell Labs inventions, the Ruby Traveling Wave Maser Amplifier, which was the lowest noise amplifier available at the time, and a large horn reflector. The horn reflector has the advantage when it's turned up of shielding its receiver from the earth around it. So the amplifier with a noise, a noise of about three or four Kelvin would not be swamped by the 300 Kelvin of the ground. So ECHO was launched and used as a microwave relay in 1960. The first transmission, Eisenhower's voice, was transmitted by JPL on the west coast received by the Horn Reflector at Crawford Hill and put out on the usual sort of radio and TV links for the world to hear. The next day there was actually a two-way conversation using the same path. So that's how communication satellites got started. A useful satellite was Telstar, which came along a little later. The 20-foot horn had a backup roll and was equipped with a traveling wave maser at 4 gigahertz, a slightly higher frequency. In 1957, I went to Caltech for a PhD in physics. That fall, Sputnik was launched uh, and I realized this was important, but I didn't realize how important it was going to be for me. <laughs> um, I joined a new radio astronomy group at Caltech. Where they had finished the heavy construction of the first Owens Valley interferometer. They needed to make low noise receivers and other instrumentation. So it appealed to me that I could do the sort of electrical engineering I enjoyed and do physics. Mm -hmm and have a combined career. Um, <clears throat> at that time, uh, there were two theories of cosmology. Back in the 20s, Hubble had discovered that various galaxies were moving away from us. And they were all moving away from us. And the picture was an expanding universe. And there were two theories of this. One was if you run it backwards, they all come together, and so it started in the Big Bang. The other one was steady state, started by Fred Hoyle. The idea was as it expands, new matter would be created, and we would see the same picture at all, at all times. My one co cosmology course was taught by Sir Fred Hoyle, and philosophically, I kind of liked the steady state. Yeah. Uh, the Hubble constant at that time, that is the rate of expansion of the universe, was being measured by two different groups, one at Caltech and one at the University of Texas. They differed by a factor of two. <laughs> Actually, it turns out if they had averaged their values, it would have been about right. In my thesis, I used one of the 90-foot antennas uh, to measure the Milky Way. Um, those 90-foot antennas, the receiver can pick up radiation from the Earth around it, and it varies with the direction of the antenna. So what I did was point the antenna to the west of the Milky Way, let the Earth's rotation scanned it across. And while that was happening, we would yeah. I need three hands. <laughs> we would get a plot on a pen recorder. If you look at the picture carefully, there are no computers in there. The output came on the pen recorder. And so from one side of the Milky Way it would go up and down. Later I would take a meter stick and draw a baseline from one to the other 
measure above that. I knew this wasn't exactly right because we're inside the Milky Way. No matter where we point, we're, we're looking through some of it. But the Milky Way is very thin compared to its diameter. Would this work? And indeed, I got my PhD. <laughs> After finishing my PhD in a one-year postdoc, I took a job at Bell Labs Crawford Hill in 1963. <clears throat> Arno Penzias had been hired a year, early, a year and a half earlier after he finished a radio astronomy thesis at Columbia with Charlie Towns, who invented the laser. Why did Bell Labs hire two radio astronomers? They're interested in communications. Well, I'm sure what they told management was that we would know about large antennas and communicating through the atmosphere. A lot of things that would be helpful for communication satellites. But I think there were two other things happening. One is, uh, Art Crawford had been the, uh, the, the lead in the construction of the 20-foot horn. By the way, you can see the, the horn up at the top of the picture there. They had cut the trees so that they could track satellites as far as close to the ground as possible. Um, <clears throat> anyway, he and Rudy Comfort were quite proud of what they had done, knew that the 20-foot horn had uh, special properties that no other radio telescope had, and they wanted to see it used. The third thing was that there had been a fair amount of pushback at Bell to Bell Labs uh, about what had happened after Jansky discovered that there was such a thing as radio astronomy. They had not really followed through very well. It was the, it was the depression. I think everyone felt they had to actually work on worthwhile things uh, rather than chasing some dream. Anyway, at this point, uh, they wanted to to actually do some astronomy, maybe make up for some of that. The attraction to Arno and me was the research atmosphere, the generous support, the opportunity to use the 20-foot horn reflector with its very low noise laser amplifiers. Both Arno and I had used larger antennas for our theses, but the 20-foot horn reflector had special properties. So we got together and we laid out plans and uh, a couple of the things we wanted to do was first of all measure the absolute strength of a radio source known as Cassiopeia A, which is the strongest source in the sky in the, in the uh, microwave range. This would be useful for radio astronomers because astronomers usually only measure the ratio of sources. They don't understand their antenna well enough to make an absolute measurement of the brightness of a source. It would be useful for satellite communications because when someone uh, built a new earth station, they could point to Cass A and see what the signal to noise ratio is. If the signal to noise ratio is what it's supposed to be, then the contractor does his job. Is CAS-A a star or a galaxy? It is a, uh, it is a supernova remnant. So, um, we, are, we had a 4 gigahertz receiver in the horn, and the, the best thing was to start with the first of these things make the CAS-A measurement in a band that was useful to satellite communications. Uh, we could also do a, a, a test measurement, a control measurement on being able to measure the background radiation, what, what a halo of our galaxy might be radiating. Because at 4 gigahertz, we were pretty sure that should be very, very small. Lower frequency measurements. 
So we built the best measuring system we could. RNA made a liquid helium and cooled reference, no ice source. That would be at about four Kelvin. I made uh, an accurate measuring system to compare the, the antenna to the helium cooled reference source. Meanwhile, Dave Hogg and I uh, hired a helicopter for a day, put a microwave source on it, and measured the gain of the horn reflector. The horn reflector is small enough we can get in what's called a far field with a helicopter and uh, <clears throat> make an accurate measurement of this gain. Here's a closer up of it. I'm not sure the FAA would have approved this notification. <laughs> 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 anyway, it all worked. <laughs> so, uh, eventually Arno and I, after about a year, Arno and I got our system together. And this is a copy of the first measurement we made. Let's see. Anywhere. Yes, yes. Yes. Oh. If you look, if you look here. Let's see. First, I should say that the received power increases to the right. Okay. So, uh, where the pointer is now, it was looking at the helium cooled reference source, which has a total temperature of about five Kelvin. Up here. Nobody can see the pointer, so forget it. Yeah. We get up there, uh, it's looking at the antenna looking straight up. And what we expected from all of our calculations is the antenna should be colder than the helium. And here it's something like three degrees hotter than the helium. So this was an immediate disappointment. Something wrong with our system. Um, actually, such a thing had been seen before at Bell Labs, but we had a direct comparison between helium and the antenna, whereas before people were adding up a lot of components and saying there's a little too much noise. Um, by this time, Dave Hogg and I had accurately measured the gain of the 20-foot horn reflector. And the most important thing for us to do was to make the Cassé measurement while that gain was still valid. We spent about nine months improving our receiver, checking it that several different ways of calibrating it gave consistent answers, and actually accurately measuring the strength of several radio sources, including Cassé. During that time, Every time we pointed to what we thought was blank sky, we saw the same excess temperature. We found no fault in our equipment or environment to explain it. After completing the CASA measurement, we started cleaning up some parts of the antenna which we not, not wanted to disturb earlier. We removed a pair of pigeons, cleaned up the droppings. <laughs> But aluminum tape you can see over some of the joints that made them more perfect. But all of this had almost no effect. <laughs> this whole list of sources we ruled out, everything we could think of, but uh, I don't think I'll go through the whole list in a long time. Um, Pigeon droppings. Anyway, we could rule out all of them. When we had eliminated almost all of the sources of excess noise we could think of, one spring day in 1965, <coughs> Arno called, yeah, it's, it's an awful sensitivity. Yeah. Arno called another astronomer, Bernie Burr, who was a very networking kind of guy. Uh, <coughs> And uh, neither one of them later remembered what the initial conversation was about. But at the end of the conversation, Bernie said, what's going on with your crazy experiment? <laughs> Turned out they had been on a plane together going to a meeting in Canada somewhere. 
and Bernie was pumping Arno, what are you two guys going to do at Bell Labs? Uh, and Arno had told him the list of things we were going to do, and he said, Bernie said, you're wasting your time, there's no halo around the galaxy. Um, I think there was a little feeling, why aren't you guys at a proper research university? But anyway. So, Arno laid it on him. Uh, we had all this excess noise we don't understand. We can't possibly do the uh, halo of the galaxy measurement. Um, Bernie said, oh, you ought to call out Bob Dickey at Princeton. Um, back, back side of this, Bob Dickey was an excellent physicist who during the Second World War worked on the Manhattan Project had written one of the books on radio, on, on microwave receivers. So he both understood physics and he understood microwave engineering. And um, in fact, one of the common measuring systems that radio astronomers used is called a Dickey radiometer. Um, anyway, after the war, Dickey got interested in gravity theory. Uh, he proposed a new addition to general relativity, which was called the bronze dickey theory, and was looking around trying to think of ways to prove that his addition to general relativity was necessary. Uh, and one of the things he thought about was a Big Bang universe. And he was thinking about the kind that has multiple explosions multiple expansions. It expands out, after a while the gravity pulls back, and it comes again, another big bang, and so on. So we have an oscillating universe. And he realized that once it came together once, it had to be good and hot. And that if it was that hot, it would be full of radiation. As it expanded, the wavelength of the radiation would expand, the frequency would go down. and by now, it would be microwaves. So he thought a, a good thing to measure would be to look for some leftover microwaves from the Big Bang. So he's a professor at Princeton. He got himself two graduate students. And being at Princeton, he got two very good graduate students. Uh, he asked Jim Peebles to make a calculation given the best astronomical data, what might you expect to see now? And he asked Dave Wilkinson to uh, make a receiver to look for it. And uh, I keep saying as an experimentalist, it's easier to make a calculation than make a device. So Jim finished first. He was asked to give a talk at Johns Hopkins. Postdocs don't turn down such things. They need, a, they need their next job. <laughs> so <clears throat> he asked Dickie and Wilkinson if, uh, if it'd be all right if he talked about his calculations. They said, sure. We're so far ahead, no one can catch up with us. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jim went off, talked to Johns Hopkins, a friend of Bernie Burke, co-worker, attended the, the colloquium, went back and told Bernie about it, and the next day Arno called Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> so indeed, uh, Arno called up Bob Dickey, and the story from Dave Wilkinson is that they were having a bag lunch, sort of what we've been having, in, in Dickey's office, discussing their experiments and calculations and things. And the phone rang. Dickie picks up the phone. They hear atmospheric radiation, sky temperature, all the things that they've been talking about. And in a little bit, Dickie puts the phone back down and says, boys, we've been scooped. <laughs> We invited them to come over and look at what we had, and they did come over the next week. 
I think that Bell Labs had such a good reputation that they believed immediately that we had done what we said. Anyway, they came, they went up on top of the hill, we showed them our equipment and the horn, and they were immediately convinced that we had made the measurement they wanted to make. Yeah. We went down into the Crawford Hill Conference Room, they gave us a little talk about cosmology. <laughs> so we decided to write two papers back to back in the Astrophysical Journal. We would write one about the measurement, they would write one about the theory. Probably each of us in the back of our mind thought, well, ours will be right even if theirs isn't. <laughs> Uh, we made one final check we hadn't made. We, we took a signal generator around and radiated the horn reflector and saw that it was not picking up any more from the ground than we expected. Uh, and we submitted our paper. Then on May 20th, 1965, exactly a year from our first me measurement, Arno and I were working up in the horn reflector and the telephone rang. This is the bell system. There was a telephone in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> no, <text, laughs> no texting. <laughs> no. no, it's a wired telephone. <laughs> and it turned out it was Walter Sullivan, the sort of lead of physics reporter, science writer at the New York Times. And he started asking questions about what we've been doing. And he asked several questions, and then uh, that was that. Uh, we were sort of wondering how he knew about it, and uh, how he knew what questions to ask. Anyway, later that afternoon, my father came for a visit from Texas. He had a uh, business in Heightstown, and um, we had his only grandchildren. So he spent the night with us. <laughs> the next morning, we got up. We were living on Spring Valley Drive in Homedale Village. Uh, while we were making breakfast, he walked down Spring Valley Drive to the center, to the pharmacy, bought a New York Times, and brought it back. And there, on the front of the New York Times, <laughs> is an article by Walter Sullivan. <laughs> explaining our measurement and the, the Princeton theory. Yeah. This showed me that other people were taking cosmology serious. <laughs> uh, Arno and I actually went to New York for a series of lectures on cosmology by Dennis Siamo, an early supporter of the steady state theory, just to bring ourselves up to date on cosmology. Well, within the first year, there, was, there were several con confirmations of what we had measured. Uh, there's, let's see, the, the point called Royal and Wilkinson is the Princeton measurement. Uh, Jim Peebles had predicted a somewhat higher temperature than about 10 degrees, whereas we were measuring about three. So Dave had to improve his experiment a little bit. But anyway, by the end of their year, they had made a measurement. Um, we had shifted to a, a lower frequency, made a measurement. Howell and Shake Shaft is a measurement at Cambridge University in the UK. And a Berkeley group, Welch and Long, had made a measurement. This is defining what we call the Rayleigh chains, the low frequency part of the curve. To prove that it's a black body, however, you have to get over the top and show that it comes down. Mm -hmm. And that was not done, uh, that was not accomplished for some time. In 1990, uh, after the Kobe satellite had, uh, had flown, uh, this curve was presented to the American Astronomical Society in a Washington, D.C. meeting. Uh, the, the left part of the curve is what we were looking at before. So this not only goes over the peak, it goes way over the peak. And 
a remarkable part of this curve is that the error bars in the measurements are entirely within the blue line. The Kobe satellite, I think, made one of the best black body measurements that's ever been made. And it's an absolute fit to a black body. Now, black bodies um, are opaque by definition. So we cannot be seeing anything that's beyond this, the source of this, which rules out any kind of thing that they might put in the steady state theory because we wouldn't be able to see any of the objects in the universe that we see. So this was really the end of the steady state theory. Well, when we first measured, we said we saw the same thing everywhere, like the top. That, that diagram represents a projection of the whole spherical sky onto that little, little football-shaped thing. Uh, over the years, some people had flown balloons and made measurements, and they saw the middle picture, which corresponds to our moving through the black body radiation. In the direction we're going, it's blue shifted, and in the direction, the opposite direction, it's red shifted. So there's what was called a, a dipole of the radiation there. Finally, uh, Kobe measured the bottom picture, which showed actual fluctuations in the, in the microwave background. This was good. Over the years, there have been several proposals for why the background wouldn't be constant. And each time technology improved, they had been ruled out. At this point, if that had been like the top picture, uh, there would be no way of explaining how we exist, how the structure that formed stars and galaxies could have formed out of that universe. So um, this worked out just the way it's supposed to. <laughs> Later, uh, the, this now is results from the Planck satellite, which show a lot of detail of the variation, and indeed the structure from which we are formed. Uh, one can derive a page full of numbers from this picture. Um, the curve on the right, the curve is a theoretical fit of the inflation followed by a big bang to the points, which are the spectrum of the variations in that picture. It's a remarkable fit. At this point, the Hubble constant, instead of being uncertain by a factor of two, is within a percent or so of no, just from this picture, and there are other ways of measuring it. Well, the density fluctuation in current galaxies uh, agrees with what we get from this picture. So the current universe and this baby picture of the universe uh, give essentially the same results. This all seems very satisfactory, except that we don't understand what 94% of the mass energy in the universe is. There's dark matter and there's dark energy. The theory depends on what happened in a highly curved space-time at very high energies, way above any energy that our uh, earthly accelerators can get to and the time scales less than 10 to the minus 32 seconds. So, these guys in 1965 <laughs> did not know how important the CMB would be. As you've gathered from what I've said, there was no real aha moment in discovering the CMB. Instead, there was a long period of trying to identify the problem uh, the importance, even after it was identified, the importance only became clear over the following years 
as theories got better and the more sensitive receivers were developed. It is, however, very satisfying to look back and see that we did our job right and to see how much has been derived from the CMB. I feel very lucky that I had a job at Bell Labs with generous support and many helpful experts. I started my career when radio astronomy and cosmology were relatively new sciences opposed to blossom as technology developed. When I entered the workforce, the nation, perhaps shocked by Sputnik and remembering the contribution of science to winning World War II, understood the value of science for its future and was willing to spend the money to be a world leader in science and technology. When you go outside, your body will absorb some of those photons. You haven't interacted with matter since the universe was 380,000 years old. You won't notice it. You're not a sensitive microwave detector. <laughs> anyway, it's been a wonderful ride.